so um, this is the uh, October 5th, 2022 Sherburn Advisory Committee meeting. Uh, and let's do quick roll call just to call the uh, meeting to uh, order. Um, so Nora. Here. Uh, Mike. Sorry, here. Uh -huh. uh, Jane, good, good for calling this order. Yep. Okay. Uh, Wasim. Hi. Steve. Here. Other Steve. I thought, think here. I saw. I, I might as well. <laughs> okay. So, so we're good. Um, so, hoping for a uh, volunteer for um, minutes. Um, if somebody would be willing to take that on. Well, Seem did the last ones. I would have okay. volunteered, but I, my eyes are dilated, so I can't even see. Uh, yeah, you did, you, again, you did the last <laughs> Nora, if you were, Nora, if you're up for that, that'd be great. No time like the present. All right, great. Thank you. That'd be excellent. Um, so give me one second and let me just read through the uh, agenda. Um, so, uh, Agenda has uh, liaison reports, discussion of the uh, OPEB funding policy draft, uh, discussion of budget guidance, and approving minutes. Um, and does anybody have any topics um, that uh, I couldn't reasonably have thought of and didn't get on the agenda? OK, so let's go to liaison reports. Um, I've got a few things to report, but let me just throw it open if uh, anybody else has anything to um, bring uh, bring to all of us. Well, I might just mention as far as the schools for the FY22 closeout, uh, Town of Sherburn actually was a little short in their school budget, so they they got a $15,000 transfer from the town um, at year end. Uh, the region was about four hundred thousand um, dollars in the black. They did a substantial, and I don't have the numbers in front of me, but they did do a substantial return of funds to the towns last year because they had uh, quite a bit of excess and deficiency. Um, they are at an. It's not certified yet, but they uh, have projected their current excess and deficiency for the closeout of the year to be at 4.39%, which is lower than the 5% we've been seeing um, in recent years. So I guess that's a, a move in, in the right direction. Um, not as low as the 4% that we had act, asked them to target. Um, in terms of the upcoming budget cycle, um, I think it will be interesting in addition to the uh, educator contract negotiations, a uh, couple of things that could be wild cards. There was a lot of discussion at the meeting about the after school program, um, which was way oversubscribed this year. They could not accommodate all the people who wanted to uh, participate in that program. And I think they're looking into seeing if they can find another location to do a second program, whether that would have any uh, whether any of that would be, you know, baked into their budget requests, I don't know, but it is something they're thinking about. Um, they also got the results of the equity audit that was done last year. Um, and there were several, I, I would say there were mostly soft recommendations in that audit. So um, not entirely clear what impact, if any, they might have on budget if implemented. But um, that is out there and it is something that, you know, the uh, school committees will be we'll be dealing with in the upcoming year. All right, thanks Jane, that's super, super helpful. Anybody else with anything and I'll- I, um, I, after last year's, you know, going through the budget process, the school actually came in lower in health insurance. Um, and I know it was asked at one of the meetings what the town is doing if the town looked into that. So Diane and I and uh, the payroll girl met with, um, Maya to see if they could do anything better for us. And then we also met with the consultant to see what the process would be if Maya can't come in any better. So we're working on that. So hopefully that we'll be able to get, see some savings in the insurance area. Uh, that's great. Is, is there a timeline, Deb, for sort of when that 
how that process is going to play out? Well, the when we talked to our rep from Maya, she said that she's in meeting with all the different towns right now. She probably couldn't get back to us until the end of October, beginning of November, and then she'll let us know if she can find anything. They didn't seem to think it was a huge time crunch as far as like being able to roll it out. You know, January, February would be fine, but we're trying to encourage, you know, encourage them to do it sooner rather than later. So we're just beginning the process. And, and would that be a matter of rates or would that be a matter of finding different different providers for, or, or who knows? Who knows? I was going to say at this point, you know, obviously the simplest thing to do would be to stay with Maya and just get better rates. You know, kind of, you know, sometimes it's an asking business, you know, what can you do for us, that kind of stuff. If they can't really come through, then the next step would be to go through and, and find new insurance carriers. You know, you hire a consultant to help you do that and everything else like that. Then you have a insurance advisory committee meetings and you make sure that it's good for the unions. And it's quite a process. Yeah. You know, we we kind of felt like if we could at least get Maya to give us better rates. And then when we have a town administrator in place next year and we'd have to go through, you know, the whole process, that might be easier on timing purposes, but we're going to see what Maya does first. Okay. So okay. Good. Thanks, moving thanks. that direction. Thanks for the update. Hopefully some good news will emerge from yeah, that. I hope so too. Um, anybody else? All right. So I've got so just a couple Dan, of things. Oh, go ahead, Wasim. Yeah, of course. So we heard from uh, the chief of police, Tom uh, Galvin, and uh, their maintenance budget is unfortunately going to go over this year. Uh, a number of uh, cars are broken, but uh, the, the silver lining is is trying hard to find uh, creative ways to fix the cars with uh, uh, maybe maybe using lower funds. So, for example, reaching out. I think was it Tri County, uh, Steve? Um, mm -hmm. Again, my eyes are dilated. Unfortunately, yeah. I can't <laughs> look at the email right now, so I can just relay from memory what uh, the correspondence was but uh, so that's one thing uh, maintenance budget i think there was they had budgeted maybe eight thousand or nine thousand and i think they're already going to go well above that this year uh, but of course i mean you, you know they're trying hard to find alternative sources to fix the vehicles that they have and then the other item is the item that they had ordered one of the cars that they had ordered is not going to be delivered i believe it was a ford and ford informed uh, them that they're not going to be able to deliver the car this year so they're looking at alternatives and there may be some differential there and steve please please jump in again my eyes i dilated i can't <laughs> yeah, this no, is all no, from memory okay. um you, you you hit all the high points um I think he ended up being able to find a Chevy Tahoe and um, I can't remember if it was more money or less money. I, um, unfortunately, I don't have access to that email on this computer, which is a work computer and mm -hmm. uh, hadn't thought that through when I logged on tonight. Um, so I apologize, but uh, that was the gist of it. Although we did mention also that most likely next year, they're going to have to replace several vehicles. What does, what's the nature of the, 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 the problems they've had with the vehicles that, that was presumably unanticipated and I guess sounds like uh, may, may require early replacement of these vehicles, like what happened? One of them, uh, the water pump went and I don't remember specifically what the other piece was, but when they brought it in to look, to have the mechanics look at it, they recommended that the body of the vehicle was still in decent shape, but to replace the motor. And they actually approached the maintenance department because there's a mechanic there that actually could replace the motor. Um, but, uh, those were the issues. I think he. I think it was a cam. Was gone, which they, they just felt that the amount of work that the engine was going to need it just would be better to replace the whole engine. But did you just kind of following on what's on Steve Sy's um, question? Did, did you get a sense that it's kind of viewed as it's just bad luck, 
Or is there some systematic thing that's happening that these vehicles aren't lasting as long as they'd hoped or? There was nothing in the email yeah. that okay. alluded okay. to it. Okay. Way. Yeah, okay. Um, all right, well, I have another, um, I have another um, police related one that came my way, um, which is you'll remember that uh, DPW uh, uh, about a month ago uh, got the select board to approve 14,000 from the used equipment revolving fund for a new snowplow. So Tom Galvin got in touch with me to let me know that uh, the p police department's going to ask for 6K from that fund for some uh, new IT equipment, some upgrades in their community training room. And also, I understand that they got some uh, six laptops from as, as part of joining the regional dispatch, and they need some docking stations and other equipment for those. So um, a little bit of a weird thing to be pulling money out of that. But, um, you know, the select board presumably will uh, approve that at their next meeting. And I appreciated that he passed it along and I passed it on to Corey, Corey Lincoln at CBC. Um, so, so one other small thing um, that's out there is, as departments draw on that, uh, draw on that fund. And the one other thing I can just mention is that the uh, rec department got a $50,000 grant from Dover Sherburn Youth Lacrosse for uh, a rebound wall at uh, Laurel Fields. Um, and given the commentary at the select board meeting, uh, lacrosse players in town were uh, very pleased about that. So just a few a few other bits I had. And unless anybody else has any other yes on reports, let's get on to talking about um, the OPEB funding policy. So Heidi, I'm going to turn it over to you. And if you'd like, I can do a screen share and put that document up. Sure. Now, if you could do that, um, it's similar to what we had last time. There are a few tweaks. So I did reach out to our OPEP advisor and spoke with them and asked about some of the concerns that were addressed, such as um, the dates, how concrete the numbers had to be, what, what would the commitment would have to be. And he said, from an actuarial standpoint, unless they have concrete numbers to work with, they can't really do any other data changes. So if we're really gonna have a policy, they felt there should be some very specific numbers in there that they can quantify and work with. Again, they stress this was a flexible policy. Um, it can be changed at any time. It does, as we noted last time, it takes a two-step process to go to advisory and select board. Um, but our current policy has been to do the 200K every year, um, which we are putting in here. I did uh, address that we should be evaluating this annually. So in section two, it says plus consider any additional COLA or other increases annually. So that would give it time for advisory to decide, do they wanna change the 200 to go up or down, um, preferably not go down, but if depending on how the money is and, and where we are standing with COLA, this will give us the option to evaluate that annually. And as well in number three, I put down the town will evaluate annually, adopt and implement this um, policy and the funding. So the reasons why to have an effective policy would be standard and poor, as we discussed last time, they usually measure the town on five to six different categories for their ratings. And this pol policies, having formal policies is part of their management score. It would have an impact to maintain our rating. Um, if we also for when we go out to bond market, it just shows that we're being fiscally prudent and we're looking forward and trying to manage our funds and our liabilities and address them. So I'm hoping people remember from last time, it is pretty short. It's this page and then the, le the second page just gives uh, where we would appropriate the amounts. And I think, um, also tomorrow at the select board meeting, we have Parker Elmore, who is our OPEB advisor, will be presenting our report to the select board. So if anyone wants to come on, he will be available to go and give us an exact rundown of how the town's doing, what are the numbers, what our funds look like. Uh, it was very informative last year. 
and it probably would be a, uh, something good to watch either if you can't make it or, or watch that little blurb again when it's on YouTube. So are there any questions? Heidi, could you repeat the date again on that, please? On, on the presentation? Mm -hmm. Yes, tomorrow night at select board meeting. Thank you. Sure. I just have one question about um, whether this is, is this intended to have us contributing 300 totally, 100 for current plus 200? Or is it no. 200 no. total? No, because it talks about how our, our it talks about the 300 they're talking about kind of our, our I think our, our annual liabilities on some of the things that we're going through, but it changes all the time. The goal of this is the 200 that we talk about the actual funding. So then my only question is, because number one says current OPEB obligations will be funded on a pay-as-you-go basis. Right. And then, so so this is just, I should know the answer to this, but I don't. So is, is both the 100 that we put in the operating budget and the 100 that we send to the trust, does that all go to the trust each year? Yes, so it does. So what we're currently doing is putting 200 a year in the trust. Right. And there, you know, there is a share that's built into our budget on the employee. The employees are contributing a portion as well. Okay. And it said, um, but it is the 200 total, 100 from our omnibus budget, line 9, 10, I think it is, and then 100 from free cash right now. Okay. So the $100,000 line item that we do in the operating budget, that is not going to pay current expenses. That's in the benefit mm -hmm. line. Right. It goes right. It goes right. It goes in. Yeah, the hundred is strictly for to go to the trust. Right. Okay. Thank you. And and Heidi, on the language in item two, where it says town will appropriate two hundred thousand, that is, I'm kind of repeating Jane's thing, but that is mm -hmm. appropriate one hundred thousand in the operating budget and one hundred thousand appropriated from free cash. That's what we've done historically in the last several years i mean that could change we could decide it's 200 free cash all one year yeah okay or, okay so okay. the the commitment yep. we're putting in writing is 200 okay how we want to allocate it will is not addressed here okay good so since everybody has this um and i think as as heidi said the words where the word like that you know reassess annually the insertion of the word annually i think is different than the draft that was sent around that i sent around this morning uh, but otherwise it's the same thing um i'm going to stop sharing for just a second so that i can see everybody again um so i was hoping you know uh, we should of course if there are outstanding issues or questions dig in and talk about it i was hoping we could vote on this tonight um, I guess for my part, um, I'm I'm a big fan of doing this kind of thing. Seems like a way of just the town clearly stating its intentions for managing finances in a responsible and thoughtful and forward-looking way, um, but yet doesn't isn't any kind of ironclad commitment that ties anybody's hands because it can uh, the policy can change if circumstances change. Um, so that's that's kind of where I am on on this one. Um, so other concerns, questions, things on people's mind before we go to vote. Does anybody feel like they don't want to vote on this tonight? I, I was thinking we probably after last week and hearing from Heidi again, probably I'm thinking we're ready. Yeah, I'm I'm good with it. I don't I don't see a particular downside to um, adopting the policy, especially since it's non binding and flexible, um, and I would be ready to vote for it tonight. Anybody else anybody with concerns before we Concerns from my end, I, I agree but but uh, just one question, the $800,000 that is that is money right now being allocated to the to the uh, what was it to the retirement fund is it right so the pension so we have a middle six county yes. right and actually we're, we're spending more than that and the the um they are out forecasting that by 2037 right about there we'll be paying 
uh, 1.6 million. So I'm saying 50% could be reallocated if we choose to. But again, we're, we're looking at 15 years from now before this is actually something we'd even have to address. Right, right. But, but by then, by 2037, we're expecting that we've fully funded the pension. But then I expect that we will continue to need to fund something towards that pension. So is that 800,000 is based on us thinking that, okay, well, 800,000 from that point on is gonna to go towards the pension and 800 is now gonna to go towards OPIP? My understanding is that when on this crossover, by the, when we fully fund, then whatever the employees are contributing is going to be the amount that will be our liability going forward past the 2037 time. Like it, it's, it's right now we have this huge liability we're chipping away at. And because in our benefit line, um, we, there is this portion of where we are doing the current liabilities. We just haven't made catch up on the pre-existing liabilities. So by 2037, we should be have caught up with what our pre-existing liabilities have been and just routinely ma managing the current liabilities each year. So and sorry, when you now you're talking about the retirement, right? Yes, yes. Yes, okay, got yes. it. Yes, but right, ideally this, this one would also work, but we're looking at this turn at crossover point is 2052 or something right now, depending on. So it's much further away. But uh, okay, the thanks. state actually had requirements where you had to be funded within a certain period of time. So we are following, but only for the pension part, there is no state requirement for OPEB yet. Uh, it's just a huge liability on towns, but the towns do have a mandate from the state to fund their retirement, which is why all the energy has gone to funding our money on up to the 2037 portion. Thanks. All right, so unless if there's any other comments or questions, I would entertain a motion to uh, for advisory to approve this uh, OPEP funding policy. So moved. Second. Okay, so uh, so let's vote. Um, uh, I'll go in reverse order this time. Uh, Steve Tsai. Aye. Uh, Steve Jeremiah. Was that a yes? Yes. Thanks. Uh, let's see. Uh, Wasim. Aye. Uh, Jane. Aye. Mike. Aye. And Nora. Aye. And I am I as well. So uh, approved uh, seven seven zero. Um, thank, thank you. Thank, thank you, Heidi. Thanks very much for your uh, efforts in uh, getting this organized and bring it to us and. Uh, hope the select board uh, sees it the same way. No, thank you, everyone. Okay, so um, so let's talk. Uh, let's talk budget guidance. Um, I thought I thought we could do this in a couple couple parts. Um, I sent around that draft letter this morning. Apologies for uh, not having gotten that done sooner. But as I mentioned, email. Uh, I had some, you know, family health things that I had to take care of, all of which is now on track and going well, um, but had to take care of that. So I lost uh, lost most of Sunday and most of Monday for uh, getting stuff done. Um, so I thought I would do just a really quick kind of a highlights of that uh, budget model spreadsheet, just to kind of show everybody how that came together. Uh, mm -hmm. And then after that, actually talk about the letter and see if the draft kind of rang true, if there are things that we need to change in it, and see if we can um, get any closer on thinking about uh, thinking about specific numbers for COLA and, um, and the departmental budget guidance. So, of course, um, as we'll talk about, uh, the personnel board has not as of yet made a recommendation. So. Uh, for a number of reasons, I think they're a little behind their ideal schedule. So, so we still don't have still don't have that piece as well. Some other information on that that I think will still be coming in. So that said, um, I'm going to just a second do a screen share and pop the uh, budget uh, model up. Um, before doing that, I just want to emphasize what I said in that email um, that it's a rough it's a rough version. 
uh, there are still plenty of numbers that are placeholders or pretty rough assumptions. Um, haven't had a time, haven't not had a, you know, just haven't had a chance to kind of go through every cell, check every formula, make sure there aren't any glitches, uh, mistakes in it. So of course, if uh, anybody is working through parts of it and you find anything that doesn't look right, please let Devin me know. So, you know, we can get, get anything that anybody sees, um, get anything that anybody sees fixed up. But all that said, let me, uh, give me just a second to get that open and walk through just a few highlight points. Okay, can everybody see that? Yep. Yes. Yeah, it's good. Okay. Um, so a few things that I uh, wanted to highlight. I'm in the summary tab, and that's really the only tab I'm going to have anything to say about tonight. Obviously, dig in as you wish to uh, all the rest. There's all kinds of great. Uh, there's all kinds <laughs> of great um, detail here. Um, I'll also mention that. Uh, the, the state uh, Department of Local Services has a module that they put together for doing five year projections and I've gotten started working on that to try to pull that out so we could have some numbers looking further ahead, but that's that's still going to take a bit of work and that's that's a little ways off um, still. Um, but so uh, here let me get this out of the way. So one thing that is uh, new that I that that's been added is this uh, small little table at the top of the summary page. Uh, for those of you who've seen this or veterans who've seen this before, where I put in some cells where one can punch in different assumptions for key inputs like guidance, the COLA, uh, CBAs, um, and also benefits. And those assumptions are linked throughout the tabs of the spreadsheet so that if one changes, say, the guidance or the COLA number, um, it will flow through and can immediately see what would the effect be on uh, total uh, general fund expenditures and also on the, uh, also on the tax rate. Um, don't, the numbers that I put in here, don't take these as really commitments to anything. We had been talking level funding, so I put a zero in for guidance. We had talked around the number 4% for COLA. Don't know if that's where we're going to end up. Um, so I, I put that in. I pulled numbers from uh, CBAs for uh, police and DPW um, for fiscal year 2024. That's just the COLA. Some of those contracts do have some other sources of compensation increases for employees. So those numbers are probably lower bounds. Um, and then with school contracts, as, as Jane mentioned, being renegotiated um, this year, don't know where that's gonna land. Um, I plugged in 4% if, if that's where we ended up thinking on the COLA, easy to see how they might end up in a similar place or maybe or maybe a uh, maybe a higher number. Um, and, and I would just uh, note one other interesting bit of information that uh, Mike Winters and I gathered in kind of connecting with uh, the personnel board. So remember that last year, the or, or for fiscal year 23, the COLA was 4%. And Nancy has uh, undertook uh, some research into what are what have other towns done? Uh, what are they intending to do? And nobody was prepared to share with her what they're intending to do because I think they're also <laughs> like we are uh, at at the beginning of that process. Um, but she did get some interesting information. Still more to get. She hasn't heard back from every town, but she talked to kind of the the comparison towns that you would expect one would want to hear from. And based on what she gathered so far, which is probably hearing back from about half the towns that she solicited info from, 4% from last year seems broadly in line with what other towns did. Um, a number of other towns, say, had a 2% COLA, but then they had 2% merit, which apparently almost everybody gets. Um, so when you sort of adjust for differences in um, merit pay, step functions, longevity, bonuses, uh, the four percent that we did last year seemed broadly in line with what um, some other towns uh, near us near us did. Um, so that's that's kind of key inputs, which 
um, in your version of the spreadsheet, or if there's something that we want to try as a group, we can change any of those and see how it affects numbers. Um, th the next thing that I wanted to draw your attention to is line 50, um, which shows in blue percent changes in total amounts that the town either has raised or is expected to in fiscal 23, or um, given our assumptions, what the number would be for fiscal 24. So you can see the history of what those have been in uh, past in past years. Um, one thing that I think is interesting in the fiscal year 23, the 4.35%, I think that's it, it's it's an interesting number because remember last year we had level funding on guidance or zero, 4% on COLA, the CBAs were pretty restrained, including for the schools. But nonetheless, we ended up at a number, a growth rate number over 4%. And the reason for that, of course, is that many departments simply couldn't make things work with level funding. So they came to us and to the select board and said, we need to go over that. And so provides a sense that even with level funding as a starting point, that last year was not the ending point. And almost surely that will be the case this year as well, that even if we start with level funding, um, as a starting point, it won't be the uh, ending point. Um, also draw your attention to line 64, the percent changes in blue. That's the percent change in the total tax levy. And that's Dan. a good, oh. So, sorry, Dan, may I ask a question? Of course, of course. On, on, on that, you, you were talking about the 4%. Th that, is, that is the change in what? In the budgeted amount? Oh, or? yeah, so that is the change in what's labeled as grand total amounts to be raised. So that is a combination of two things. It's what we approve for the general fund. And then it's also these other amounts to be raised, which are these various mishmash of various state mandates and other things. Uh, might've been more interesting to, um, you know, look at percent changes in the total operating budget. They would be a little bit different and, and that might be more interesting because that's closer to what we actually are engaged with um i should probably add that I, I i just i didn't get to i didn't get to getting that sorted out i think it would be broadly similar though of course not not exactly the same yeah thank you uh, while we're doing questions i should stop what else because i've just been talk talk talking so before i keep doing that let, let me stop and See if there's anything anybody else wanted to jump in on. Okay, I thought another interesting set of numbers was line 64, which shows percent changes in the tax, total tax levy. And that number is interesting because it gives an indication of um, what's going to happen actually to tax bills. So you know, what, what's going to happen to the size of checks everybody needs to write to the town. This line gives an indication of that because it, uh, you know, uh, take, takes account of non-property tax revenue sources. Um, and then uh, jumping down a little bit more to this lower panel, uh, this panel shows estimated tax rates. So I'm on line uh, 80. And you can see for fiscal year 2022, the 1903, which is with the uh, bills that just came out a couple of weeks ago, that was the number for 22, which is still being used as a preliminary number for 23 until the 23 numbers are finalized. Uh, notice that the tax rate in 23 goes down by a considerable amount. And that of course reflects um, <coughs> a large assumed increase in uh, total property tax value or assessed values. Um, and what I have built in for fiscal year 23 in this budget model is a 10% increase in assessed values for fiscal year 23, which of course is based on assessments as of January 1st, 2022, the way that the, the lags work in that. And then I built in a 4% increase for fiscal year 2024. Um, and that's based on what is <laughs> on January 1st, 2023. 
And so we know that house prices are kind of plateauing, flattening out. First half of the year up a bunch, now flattening out, maybe down. So after a bit of consulting, thinking, uh, you know, these were estimates that I thought were reasonable. Nora, I would love to hear your reactions to that and whether that strikes you as sensible place, um, sensible place to land. Um, but let me just finish a couple of things and then let's come to that. So with those assumptions, the tax rates would be 1841 this year and 1829 for fiscal year 24. Um, of course, if the spending numbers for fiscal year 24 go up because level funding doesn't work for many departments, then indeed the tax rate in uh, fiscal year 24 would um, would move would move higher um, as well. So that is a really quick tour through budget model as it stands now. Plenty more work to do, plenty of refinement, plenty of new information on what's going to happen on benefit increases and many other components of this um, that are still kind of placeholders. Um, and the assessment of what's happening with the school assessment is still pretty rudimentary. Um, but I think it, it, it provides a tool that we can use for asking questions like, if the COLA changes from four to five, what are the implications? If guidance changes from zero to something bigger, what are the implications? So let me stop there. Um, I'm gonna see if I can, no, I can't. I wanted to see if I could get this so I could see everybody. Um, given that everybody has a copy of the spreadsheet, I think I'm going to stop screen sharing so that I can see everybody can always bring it back up if necessary. And let me just throw this open for comments, questions, concerns. Nora would love to hear your thoughts on, um, the numbers I came up with for assessed increases and in assessed values and any other comments and once we get through that, we can then actually talk about the draft guidance letter. Okay, I also see Wendy here too, so that's great. Um, oh yeah, yeah, hey Wendy. Hi Wendy. Uh, so 10% increase, and, and Wendy, can you add any, um, is it appropriate for me to ask Wendy based on the Department of Revenue for MA, Mass Department of Revenue, Revenue, is it going back two years? Can you? So right now I am in the process of our five-year recertification, um, revaluation, and um, we are going through the process of getting certified to set the tax rate. Um, so right now it's based on sales for from 2021. Um, and there will be some style homes that will be increased more than 10%. Um, there may be certain classes, like for example, you know, um, a Cape style home will have a different percent increase than, um, you know, your, your typical colonial on Harrington Ridge or Ivy Lane or, you know, so it's kind of not a broad it would make my job a lot easier if I could just say, okay, 10% across the board for everyone, mm -hmm. right? Um, but we can't do that. So um, so yes, generally it would be 10%, but there are several properties that their value is increasing by two to $300,000, um, if not more. And um, in a, we have what we call an assessment to sales ratio and we have to fall within a certain percentage for certification standards. And um, last year I was at 98% assessment to sale ratio. Um, prior to me coming on board, we were at about like 92, 93% assessment to sales ratio. Um, and in a, what I would call kind of normal years, if there has been in real estate, I was at about 95, 96, and I've been slowly increasing. So for fiscal 22, I was up to a 90, 98% assessment to sales ratio. And that's probably where we will fall this year because we will see an increase in fiscal 22 as well. 
And then what happens is as the market starts to stabilize, you know, the assessment to sales ratio starts going down a little bit to catch up with the decreasing, potential decreasing costs. But we have to see what the market's going to do in 23. I didn't mean to pass that off to Wendy, but she has such a more helpful, streamlined way of putting no, that's, it. That's, that's no, great. no, Dan and I have talked about this. Yeah, so, well, yeah, yeah. Wendy, Wendy and I had a chance to talk this past yeah. week, so I wasn't uh, I wasn't just throwing darts at a dartboard, though the numbers are mine and not Wendy's. Mm -hmm. I was. Yeah, I, mean, I was throwing the dart. No <laughs> it's always throwing the dart. Um, but I do like to see. It, well, OK, so obviously things have increased in value in market value, which obviously brings in up assessed values. Uh, there is a lag there, as Wendy just said. And as far as a four percent increase in fiscal, I was taking notes. This is a good thing about me doing all this. I can read. Microsoft Word here as I took this down. Um, the four percent increase you mentioned in fiscal year twenty twenty four is um, what comes up to one one twenty three, correct? So I, I think it's prices are still up there, and um, I feel like they will be flattening. But it really, it's all over the place. We still have only about sixty five, well seventy homes. 65 to 70 homes a year selling the last couple of years, Wendy. I'm trying to think there are some off-market ones that no, have sold. it's about 100. Um, I think last year there was 107. And this year, I want to say there was over 100. Um, okay. In the and previous those are considered years. arm's length. Yeah. So uh -huh. over the past four years, it's been between like 83 and 100. Uh -huh. um, and then in the earlier years, when I started, that was eight years ago, it was like 65, 70. And now mm -hmm. they're over, you know, almost always close to or over a hundred. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and our product is what about twelve hundred to fourteen hundred? Just depends on what you're looking at. Uh yeah, single family homes. I think it's thirteen hundred and fifty six. Um, mm -hmm. Condos, one hundred and eighteen, and multifamilies. I want to say. Um, it's 13 maybe. And this clearly means I need a life because this is all from memory. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm duly impressed. Don't need a life at all. Yeah, I'm That's impressed. Crazy. I, knew, I, I was going to say those are very that. specific numbers for saying <laughs> just, about. Yeah, just geek yeah. out. Just totally geek out. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Wendy. Thanks, Wendy. So, yeah, again, I think that's great. And I always love to see a lower um, tax rate because that just keeps us competitive with other towns. It does, yeah, yeah, for sure. Of, of, of course, my, my hunch is that other towns will be seeing significant increases in assessed values too. And depending on what they're doing with budgets, you know, we'll right. have similar effect, you know, like that have similar effects on tax right. rates. But right. moving, moving further away from the kind of 20 seems, seems really good. Mm -hmm. Yes, for sure. And um, that's, you know, always been my, my goal, um, talking to Nora and other agents, and it's it's a perception, right? Um, it, but I, you know, I do want to let you guys know, and we'll have this talk a little, you know, maybe a month or two down the road. Um, you know, the budget increased, the tax the tax rate will go down, but values are still going up hundreds of thousands of dollars. So there is going to be a impact in people's tax bills. Um, you know, and like I always say, and I said it to Dan earlier today, if the budget was half of what it was, your taxes would be half of what they are, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's, it's hard. It's a hard time for everybody. And we've also faced inflation and... Um, it's it could be a hard year, um, but that's unfortunately there's really nothing that we can do. We've tried to be careful and level spend, but um, just to get that out there now so that you're not surprised by it in a few months. And uh, this. Um... Uh, thanks, Wendy. I was just going to say the spreadsheet, of course, showed the same thing in that tax rate went down, but the overall tax levy in FY23 went up over 
And that would be, you know, best estimate of how much people's tax bills are going to change, as, just as Wendy was saying, given, given what the budget did last year. So, and, and that's, uh, as, a, as a taxpayer, that's actually a positive thing. It's, it's okay for the tax bill to go up because, you know, we don't have, we're not building more houses necessarily. Right? It just means that our property values are going up. Yeah. And it's good to see the tax rate going down. That's yeah. that's very positive. Absolutely. If if these two continue to go in tandem, uh, I think uh, speaking for myself as a property, you know, owner, owner is, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'll still be happy. That means that it, it, you know we don't have the kind of the downward spiral. This is upward right. spiral, and it's it's okay. Right. Correct. Correct. And right. Wasim, if you're available from January 2nd until February 1st, you can just come and sit in my office and have that conversation <laughs> with everybody coming in. <laughs> that would be fabulous. No, but it is. It, it, it is. It's showing yeah. that we're strong. It really is. Yeah, no, that's a really important point, Wasim. I mean, I, I may be painted a little bit of a dark picture, but that, that's, I mean, that's a really important point that you know, it, it, in a way, it's a there's definitely a way in which it's a good news story about what's happening in Sherburne. Jane, it looked like you wanted to get in with a comment or a question. Yeah, sorry. I just um, just out of curiosity, Wendy, you mentioned that there is an, a, an acceptable range of um, market to assessment. And I'm just wondering what that range is. Um, so it is 90 percent to 100 percent. And then our highest class code, which is a 101 single family, needs to fall within, um, I'm sorry, any other class, but, but single families are, can be in the range of 20%. But for our highest class code, which is single families, that falls within 10%. So every sale would either, ha you know, would have to be 95 assessment to sales ratio to a hundred point, you know, a hundred point oh five. Um, so in that 10% range. So let's just say my lowest assessment to sales ratio was a 90. The highest it could go would be a hundred percent. So we can go over that 5%. So by being at 9.98%, you know, it does tip it a little bit, but I, I really think that the market um, calls for this and the sales prices really call for um, being, I remember last year calling Steve Sai and, and just letting him know, I'm going up to a 98% sale assessment to sales ratio. Um, and it just calls for it because, there was the increase last year. I knew there was an increase coming this year and there'll be an increase coming next year. So you don't want to just not do anything, right? You want to do interim adjustments. So I do interim adjustments. Some communities do, some communities don't, but it helps with, um, with it not spiking all in one year. Could you elaborate, Wendy, just one? Example, for example, say there's an assessed, a home that's assessed, let's just make it easy, at a million dollars, and then it transacts at, for 1.5 million. So mm -hmm. how does that translate into the following year, the following two years? Okay, so um, every year, it's a different analysis. Um, so, and again, like Nora said, we don't have a lot of sales. And so, you know, we hang our hat on the 100 sales that we have and that's our analysis so if we have you know 15 ranches um that sell between seven let's i'm just say let's say six hundred thousand to eight hundred thousand um then you know see we, we could really get into the weeds with this because it really depends if their house is, it, then it gets down to the condition of the home. It gets down to how many bathrooms, how many bedrooms, how many, you know, is it in good condition? Is it in fair condition? So to really give a straight answer, 
is kind of hard um, because if, just, if you were to, yeah, go ask well, me that I'm again. just saying, but like a hard sale. So that was, you know, um, it was assessed in a million in 2022 assessment. Yeah. So but it sells in 2022 for 1.5 million. So for half, for half a million more. Yep. Then when does that become that 98% or just call it 100%? When does that become assessed <laughs> at 1.5 million? Um, well, it, I mean, it might never, it, it depends on the ratio that it, it falls in. Um, okay. mm -hmm. yeah, it, so, you know, it, it might never, it might never get up to that 1.5, but there are some sales because it's mass appraisal that some, some sales, you know, some values are going to be a little bit over, you know, and then we have the outliers as well. Um, that they're almost an over improvement, if you will, um, like 134 and 134A Farm Road. Um, I've received, you know, several inquiries as to why it's on the market for 8 million, but we only have it assessed for four. But what people don't know is that's actually three separate lots and three separate tax bills and there's another home on it so it's actually assessed at like six million so not everything people they just see they just dropped really the price wendy to six and a half <laughs> oh good and 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 the, uh, ironically this is a this was an appellate tax board it's actually a case um that we won about uh, i mean that we i'm sorry we won it once and then we lost it um and the ATB um, had us reduce the value on it and told us to keep it there. Um, so anyway, I'm going way off topic. Um, so yes, so if a house sells for 1.5 tomorrow um, and where, so in 2020, fiscal 2024, that sale would be used. Um, in its in the analysis, so it might never get to one point five. It might go over one point five. All right, that that was okay. my question. Thank okay. you. Okay. okay, thanks, Wendy. Um, so anything else on kind of spreadsheet? How to use it? How to play with it? Before we talk about guidance letter. Okay, so let me switch gears and get the guidance letter draft up. Okay, so that hopefully is visible and readable. Um, so here's the Hopefully, I know I only sent it around uh, this morning. Hopefully, people had a chance to look at it. But the basic setup is three paragraphs of background, kind of just highlighting uh, budget situation, a little info on what some of the things we just talked about with what's going to be happening to uh, likely happening to tax rates. Um, uh, the third paragraph of background, just reminding people that there's a lot of stuff in the future that may. Uh, impose some sizable costs on the town that are just big uncertainties. And then a section on the COLA, which tracks uh, some of our conversation from last week with some background numbers on what's been happening to inflation, what are some other kind of notable COLAs. Um, as mentioned, uh, the personnel board has not yet made a recommendation. Uh, I think my guess is that they're going to again recommend a range uh, or suggest a range as they did last year, and then we'll end up needing to actually pick pick a number. And then the final important section, substantive section being on departmental operational expenses. And I was trying to capture our conversation from last week. So I invented a term called level funding plus with the idea of use level funding as a starting point, but um, advisory is, as, as I understood our conversation, advisory is open to uh, budget makers coming and saying, hey, here's what's happened to the cost of 
asphalt, here's what's happened to the cost of gasoline. Here's a item, here's a line in our budget where level funding just doesn't make sense. And here's here's what here's what a uh, budget maker thinks would be a sensible number, and here's the rationale. So trying to say something other than just level funding, because I think while we were all focused on level funding as a as sensible place to start, trying to convey that it's level funding, but we're going to listen to explanations people have of where and why that um, where and why that doesn't work. And the rest of the letter is pretty much just standard boilerplate, uh, a little bit of stuff about capital budget and then timeline and schedule and and all. Um, so I was going to suggest um, again, so if people have had a chance to read it and think about it. I think it'd be great to actually do some on-screen line editing. If people haven't really had a chance to do that yet, and then we want to talk bigger picture, that's fine too. We can do some of each. Um, we can talk about the number for col the COLA. We can talk about whether this phrasing that that's in here of level funding plus kind of works for people, or if it, that works for everybody, or that should be something different. Um, and then the plan would be to come back to this at our next meeting on November 2nd, um, get it finalized and uh, get, get it get it finalized and then get it uh, get it sent out. So anybody want to start in with either big picture comments or particular line edits where phrasing, uh, where people would prefer that you know we do this a different way than what's what's here. Dan, my my only comment was on when you said on the budgeting, um, it says FY twenty three to base it on FY twenty three operational. They don't really have the departments don't have a uh, yeah there it is. Um, so specifically, we asked departments to use the FY23 operational expense values as a starting point. We don't really have a whole year. Historically, we always used FY23 budget oh, as okay. the basis. All right, so let's great. So let's so let's do FY23 budget better. Yes. Great. Okay. Good. Thanks. That's great. What else? The um, level funding plus, I, I, I think it is an accurate statement of how we have behaved and will behave. My only concern about adding the plus is that we're not really substantively. I don't think, and I apologize because I did miss the last meeting, but I, I'm, I didn't think that we were substantively changing the way we were going to approach things this year. I mean, I think we're still basically saying what we've been saying, which is you know, go at level funding, but tell us if you need more. And my only concern is that because we haven't used that plus term in the past, um, budget makers may very well zero right in on that and think, oh, it's loosened up this year. When I'm not really sure that's what we mean to convey. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the way I was thinking about it was, um, that in a sense last year, that, that this really is the same as last year, but last year we didn't call it level funding plus, but that's really what we did because we knew that plenty of departments weren't actually going to come in with level funding. Uh, but if, you know, the sense is that it would be better to just say level funding and then add the words that, of course, you know, advisory would, uh, you know, would be open to explanations and requests from the different, you know, we, we certainly could go that, certainly could go that route. Other thoughts on that or other, or other points? Dan, I, I, I second Jane's comment. Okay. You know. Okay. I third it. Okay. Anybody else? This is Mike. I, I would agree. Okay. All right. So it sounds like um, we should then just say, take the uh, 
quotation marks out and just say level funding approach. Um, I, I do suspect, and, and maybe this is a good thing, I do suspect that this will um, cause some heartburn for uh, department heads. We'll say, oh, come on, you've got to be kidding me. You know, can't believe, can't believe you're saying this. Um, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't say it. I, I do suspect that will be, I do suspect that will be a reaction. We have been essentially saying this for each of the past five years, though, and it may cause heartburn every time, but aside from, you know, one or two exceptions that I don't think it usually ends up uh, resulting in them, uh, you know, cursing us in their budget meetings. <laughs> I, I, I agree. And I think the verbiage behind it really kind of is a rationale, like, you know, if you do have something, you know, bring it forward. So. I think it, I think it's fine. Okay, so so it sounds sounds like the consensus is to to do it the way that it's here, with just recommend a level funding approach. Okay, good. Um, what else? Well, I guess this is stating the obvious, but I I think the. I think the stakes are a lot higher this year on the COLA number we choose than they typically would be. And, but, and the reason I say that is that is because of the you know, the, the teacher contract negotiation, right? I mean, whatever we do there is going to have a very large telegraphing effect on that negotiation. Typically, when we put that number in, we're just talking about the non-contracted um, you know, town employees, which is not a huge, you know, dollar figure in and of itself. But given that the teacher contract is such a huge percentage of our, well, the teacher, the school budgets are such a huge percentage of our um, but the overall budget. And then the, the teacher salaries are such a big percentage of the overall school budget. You know, that, that number, whatever number we choose is gonna be very significant this year. So, so your sense, Jane, is that, um in those negotiations, they will be looking at this COLA as an important input into their conversation. I would think they'd use it as a starting point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So interesting. I've, I've heard, I've heard commentary on all sides of this. I've heard, you know, many other people, Jane, say the same thing you did. I've heard other people say, oh, they're in their own world. They do their own thing. Won't make any difference. Um, though I've heard many other people, uh, you know, who shared the view you just expressed, uh, um, it's going to be a starting point for, for them. Well, that's what the town got. So we need to get that plus something more. I mean, I would suspect also though, that it, let, let's say that we made COLA 2%, you know, we just kind of went crazy. They would probably just ignore that in their in their contract negotiation, right? They wouldn't be like, oh, look at look at how conservative Sherburne was. We have to keep our salaries low because of that. I don't I don't think that they would do that, right? Right. And I and I think there's an understanding as well as you're not comparing apples to apples because the teachers have steps and lanes and everything else like that. And the right. you know the cola for the town is is strictly that's all there is. There's no merits, there's no longevity, there's nothing. So you're, you're really the comparison is not even this, you know, apples and oranges. I think that's true substantively, but I also think that as a negotiating tactic, you know, I mean, it, you know, there's different, I, I think that the, that the number that the town chooses will be a number that will be significant in terms of the town's, um, you know, ability to negotiate. Yeah, I, I I just think it's a shame to uh, penalize the few employees that there are because of a possible, you know, factor in the unions when it, if, if you know, the negotiations went well and people explain the fact that there are no, uh, you know, steps and lanes and everything else like that for the employees that are getting this COLA, it would be a shame to penalize the people who rely on this COLA percentage. But we make a year by year decision for those folks as well. So it's not a three year, you know, it's not locked in in the same way that it is for the teachers. So, you know, that some of that could in theory be made up, say next year. 
for the town employees. You know, some of it was made up last year because town got four and the schools were at three under the current contract. So, you know, it, yeah, it I mean, yeah. do we know, and maybe Nancy Hess, maybe you have the answer to this, but do we know what Dover's um, COLA was for um, the current year? Hold on. You mean FY23, Steve? Uh, I'm yes. Almost, I'm almost sure Dover um, got a 4%, and they also have um, stepping, like I think a five year step increase so that when you're hired, there's like a 20 to $30,000 swing between when you start and at your top step on top of COLA. And we don't do that in Sherburn. Sure. Nancy, it last year? Maybe, it, yeah, maybe it was. Nancy, do you, I, I was looking at your spreadsheet. I think I'm showing it on the screen, um, which from the numbers Nancy got, it looks like, Nancy, jump in here, please. But it looks like a 2% <laughs> COLA then with step increases and longevity stuff um, on top of that. Um, I'm sorry, I was, I stepped out of the room for just the wrong second, so I missed the beginning of your, what, what town are you talking about? So, so the question, Nancy, was about what, what did Dover do in FY23? <clears throat> okay, it looks like they gave a 2%, but they also, on top of that, they have a step program for, for their non- union people as well as, you know, your teachers have that. So there are 10 steps that people, and they also have longevity after five years they get. So she couldn't give me a hard, fast number with this and translated into as an overall um, increase. But she said they are reviewing policies. And I found that in several of the towns that they're doing uh, compensation studies and so forth. And one of them said they just, they have too many open p positions. People leave to go for better pay. So there are several of them that are reviewing uh, compensation. Of course, it's a very strange time. So it's hard to, to make broad judgments from all of this. But my understanding is last year <clears throat> it was 2% and then people had steps up to 2.75%. Uh, and the longevity, which was $40 per year that you've been there after five years. Um, may, may I just, uh, Jane, I, I, I agree with you about, you know, it's something to think about with regards to the, uh, you know the, the negotiations but i also my 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 feeling is that so i i work in an engineering company and when we compare let's say engineering salaries we're not going to compare it with what the town employees do right so it's just my sense and I, I could be completely wrong that they'll the comparables would not be town employees necessarily but rather other teachers in other districts maybe so that's just my sense and i i i, I certainly would not be <laughs> of the opinion to to make the teachers negotiation influence the cola for our non-contracts employees so that's kind of my my, my sense on this So I think at our last meeting, since, since we're on the COLA point, um, so I think the general sense expressed was 4% was kind of the bottom of what people thought was a plausible range. Is that still true? Jane, it sounded like you might have been thinking something different and you didn't get a chance last time to be in on that. I wouldn't say I'm necessarily thinking something different, I, but I would be very interested, and I know we don't have it right now, but I, I, 
to me, the comps are, you know, what's very important for what other towns are doing because to the extent that we can get that information because, right, to, you know, right. what, whatever it is, it is. And I think we should be in line with what it is. Right. So, so uh, I think Nancy is working on that. And I think, you know, by our, I think by our next meeting, the, I think if the personnel board will have digested all of that and we'll have come up with a recommendation and we'll have some more information on that as well. So, you know, we don't need to nail that number down tonight, but just wanted to give people a chance to share views and thoughts on on that as we as we you know continue to work at this. Other um other other things in the either other more comments on cola or comments or other comments or concerns about the letter. I just wanted to say, Dan, very well written. And uh, right before the cola for non-contract employees, you have an additional but there. <laughs> uh, yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yep, thanks. That's why it's good I know I'm saying, I'm saying these out of order here, but also the other comment, and I think we mentioned this maybe last year as well, is you know, the cola is more of a smoothing function. So, you, you know, we know the you know, in prior years, maybe the inflation was a little less than two, but we had the cola at two. And then this past year we had four. Uh, you know, I, I, I think the cola is more like a smoothing function. It doesn't necessarily jump exactly with the uh, CPI, but over time they should track is, is really the comment I'm trying to make. Yeah, my, my hunch is I, I, I thought about trying to build that in as, as we did last year, but I think given how high the inflation numbers have been for two years in a row, I think at 4% this year, I think em employees are, the non-contract employees would not be keeping up, even, even looking back over the last you know three years or something. Yeah, I mean, I would agree, I, I, you know, last year, again, you know, I think I went through a lot of mental gymnastics to um, justify the 4%. It was, it was brilliant. Yeah, just, despite the fact that inflation was obviously greater than 4% over the preceding 12 months, you know, but essentially it got us to the point where, okay, well, we could make the argument that um, we were keeping our employees kind of uh, barely afloat. Um, up to you know that point last year, I, I don't think there's any argument around the fact that um, now over the the following 12 months, uh, inflation's been eight percent, right? And we can go with uh, in the Northeast region. I think you said it was seven point four percent. Yeah. Uh, to me, uh, that's the that's the realistic maximum range, right? For to me, for the cola is. Uh, there's a very logical argument for it should be 7.5% probably um, because anything less than that, I, I'm, I'm pretty sensitive to the argument that a COLA that is less than inflation is actually a pay cut, you know? And so mm -hmm. if a col if the COLA is less than 7.4%, then it's kind of a pay cut. Um, we could make the argument that, uh, well, it's too big of a jump in one year and maybe we'll plan on, we'll see what inflation is for FY25 and then maybe plan on, you know, smoothing it out. But it's like, then, all right, next year's advisory committee has to remember that and say, okay, well, even though inflation was 3% over, you know, the 12 month period ending in September of 2023, we're going to give everybody 5% because that's what we said we were going to do when we shorted them last year. And it's like, uh, well, I don't, I don't feel good putting next year's advisory committee into that position. You know what I mean? Um, so, so realistically to me, it's like, well, the COLA range probably should be somewhere between four and seven and a half percent. Um, and for, for perspective, I punched in 7.5% into your, into your, um, budget model here. And that increases the tax rate by six cents. Yeah. So that's, you know, that's not a lot. Um, but I am, I, you know, I think I am also sensitive to Jane's point that that is going to be viewed at, you know, if that is a favorable COLA, that's going to be viewed as a starting point for the contract negotiation for the teachers union. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll use that as a point in their favor. Um, 
I don't know that that is unfair uh, because teachers also deserve to be paid. And if the inflation was seven and a half percent, then the teachers probably also deserve um, to be paid in a way that keeps up with inflation, right? I think everybody deserves that. Um, and that's just something that we're going to have to deal with in terms of the upward pressure on um, the town's budget is uh, in inflation is going to make everything cost more and we're just going to have to be prepared for that. Yeah, Steve. Um, so just uh, that, that was really interesting. Um, so just a couple, couple um, additional thoughts. Um, the mental gymnastics that I thought about, but I judged weren't, weren't going to be helpful is given what the Federal Reserve is doing with interest rates, it's, it's very likely that inflation is going to be moving down pretty significantly by the end of the year. But it seems like a long shot to say, hey, feel good about a small COLA because even if the inflation is really high now, it's going to be lower in the future. So I didn't, I didn't want to go down that road. Um, but if we were thinking about smoothing and thinking about, you know, where might inflation be next year, um, you know, you could, you, you could get to something less than, um, you know, seven and seven and a half, uh, seven and a half percent. And of course, the other challenge is that um, I, I think what you said is exactly right, that a coal, that a coal of less than seven and a half percent represents uh, a, effectively a, a pay cut in terms of purchasing power. I think it is just a real challenge for Sherburn and really for all employers to confront a world where costs of a lot of items have gone up and somebody's got to cover that. So not everybody can be uh, fully compensated for those higher costs um, because the costs, the costs went up. And so I think that's why a lot of colas, like the federal U.S. federal government colas, um, and and kind of you know what, what's what's the trend in weight, what's the overall trend in wage increases, um, you know it's running below nationally, it's running below um, inflation rates because in a time of energy and food and materials costs going up, um, you know collectively everybody's living standard falls and. Then we get into the trade-off of, you know, taxpayers can pay more, and then that works a bit better for employees, or you know, some complicated way of thinking about how that burden is allocated. I've never thought of cola as a as an exact uh, science in the sense that, um, you know, some years. To your point, Dan, inflation may be higher, but the colon may be a little lower for, for all the reasons, the good reasons that you stated. Um, you know, for many years we were giving two percent increases, and inflation was below two percent. You know, so I mean, it's I, I don't think it's I I think it's a, 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 a the inflation rate it informs the decision making process, but I've never we've never behaved in a way where or at least in my you know recent in my experience on advisory we've never behaved in a way where where it was um well because the inflation rate is x the cola must be x and i i would dare to say that it is would be very i, I think there would be very few workplaces where that would be the operating principle well i think you have to keep in mind too that you i mean sherburn is um uh, unique in the fact that COLA is also our merit raise. You know what I mean? There, there is no merit, there's no longevity, there is nothing else. So some, some communities who may have a lower COLA, the employees still get compensated. In Sherburn, they don't. Whatever you decide here is what the employees get compensated. So, in, you know, I'm, I, you know I'm, I'm defending, you know, the people in town hall and, you know, if you think about the work that we've done in the last year, we've been operating without a town administrator for close to a year. Every department has stepped up, done their job, and gone beyond, above and beyond doing their job. And to hear you talk about, it's for every percentage, it costs the town $26,000. It, it's a little bit deflating to hear, uh, you know, a conversation about, a small piece, a small percentage of the budget. 
when this inf impacts employees, you know, that work very hard during the course of the year. Yeah, and Deb, that's totally appreciated. And, and quite honestly, I do think my own thinking about this would differ if we weren't in a contract negotiation year for the for the you know for the teachers. But yeah, I, I, I and think that that is a big factor this year. I really do. Yeah, I, I know. And again, I guess it, that is a factor, but it, how big of a role does it really play in their contract negotiations? Do we know? And again, I, I feel like it's not quite, you know, fair to penalize the employees based on a possibility that it might impact negotiations. But it, I mean, it's obviously it's your decision and, you know, everybody will live with the, whatever decision you make. Sorry, I was just playing with the uh, spreadsheet for a second. Um, one other, one other, just number I'll uh, just toss out is I just uh, looked up. You can see it on the screen here. Um, this is through June of 2022. It's a quarterly series. It's called the Employment Cost Index, and they track um, wages and salaries as well as overall compensation, including benefits. So I was just looking at the line here where wages and salaries uh, through June increase. Dan, FYI, the your screen share, I believe, is restricted to the guidance letter window. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Your full screen. Okay. Good. All right. So that means uh, that's good. Nobody could see the uh, <laughs> could see the other stuff I was doing on the side. It's all good. Um, so what, what I looked up, uh, thanks, Steve. What I looked up was um, uh, statistics on the employment cost index, which is probably the best uh, national indicator of what's happening to wage changes. And that um, number looking at wages and salaries for the year ending in June was up about five and a quarter percent. So, you know, one more data point. Um, to, to my earlier point, less than inflation, um, because in this period in general, wages are not keeping up with inflation nationwide, but uh, higher than the, you know, 4% number that was the COLA uh, uh, last year. All right, so I was going to suggest that on the COLA, a lot of interesting conversation, um, maybe set that discussion aside because I think the personnel board is going to gather some more relevant data. I think they're going to mull all of this over. I'm sure Nancy will bring some of what we've talked about back, back to them. And maybe we can work on setting that as you know something to be finalized um at our at our next meeting when we wrap up this letter um since i suspect we could keep talking about that for a long long time tonight um so i wanted to see if there were other um elements of the letter that people thought we need to we need to work on um, can you scroll down to the, the, do you have dates already written down for different department heads and things like that? I didn't scroll all the way down to the end of the letter. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Deb, for bringing that up. Um, so um, I didn't put that in. Uh, sort of perhaps in the vain hope that, you know, we'd have a town administrator soon and that that town administrator that Jeremy might have kind of views about how that would be organized. And so I was hoping to have a chance to check in um, on that, but given that it's already uh, October 5th, um, uh, you know, it may just be we just need to proceed as we have in the past. Um, I will put that together uh, soon. Well, um, I, I was wondering if, you know, instead of putting something together, because I was on the same page as you were as, okay. as far as hoping that Jeremy might have a a more concise way of, you know, reviewing all yeah. these that maybe, you know, there could just be a blurb that said a, you know, meeting date scheduled to follow or something like that, rather than having to um, confirm to that at, you know, in November when we really don't start meeting until January or February, maybe, you know, at the mid-December, the, the dates could come out or something like that, but not at this point until we know, you know, if there, if, if Jeremy is going to be on board and yeah. he has a different philosophy. Yeah. So, th so that's interesting Deb, because, you know, I, you know, I, I like a lot of people watched uh, some of the Medfield uh, 
uh, Medfield budget meetings where Jeremy is involved in, in their finance committee. And they did things in a very different way where the town administrator really took a lead in kind of bringing uh, department budgets to uh, finance committee as compared to each, uh, each department head doing that. Um, I would be fine waiting. The only concern would be how much advance notice do people need? And if in mid-December we put something out that said on January 9th, here's the group of people we'd like to meet with, is that enough time for people to get schedules um, to work? And, and if the general sense is, uh, particularly for those of you who've been on advisory longer than, than I have, that that would be okay, I, I would be fine um, holding off on that. I was actually thinking that I would just go ahead and 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 set the schedule now. Um, you know, to the two thoughts being that, again, not speaking for our potential new TA, but I mean, I think most most good leaders would um, would agree that the best course of action in your first year is to not do anything and to sit back and observe how the town um, functions and then um, make changes as they see fit, as opposed to completely changing how the town runs from day one. Um, and then the other thought being that, um, you know, it's already October, the likelihood that the new TA is gonna come in and have a very significant active role in the setting of the budgets um, is pretty low since the budgets are due on December 31st. So. I don't know that he would want to be uh, wholly responsible for the budgetary meetings to defend uh, budgets that he had no part in creating, right? So um, so I would imagine that this year's budget season is probably going to run very similar to last year's. So I would I would be a proponent of just setting the setting the schedule now. Anybody else on that? Yeah, I, I think I agree with Steve, but the other thing is I'm not sure we necessarily we could can't we kind of have it both ways? Because if yeah. we just say this department will have its discussion on such and such a date, we're not saying so and so you will be there. Yeah, and 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 I also think you know we can put a schedule out, and I could uh, try to write write a sentence to go with it, either in the letter or at the top of the schedule um, that just you know alludes to the fact that there might be some adjustments. Um, you know, can't think of quite the right words now, but I'm sure the words are out there. But the idea being, you know, there might be some adjustments if there's a new town administrator uh, on board in time. Although, as as Steve highlighted, might very well just want to watch the process rather than try to um, alter it. So, um, so I'll, I'll I'll put a draft schedule together, um, and everybody can look at it and. You know, see that for uh, can see that for uh, next time, and maybe there's as Jane said, it can be departments rather than individuals. And if there is a new town administrator soon, and that town administrator has strong views about how we uh, schedule that, it could certainly be revised as needed. Okay, so what else? Anything else on the anything else on the letter? I'm hopefully interpreting the general lack of comments as people are generally okay with what's here. I thought it was okay. very good, Dan. Okay. All right, good. Um, so this was this was great. Um worked out a couple of rough spots in the letter and um Got, I think, some interesting information out there on COLA that we can all think about before the next meeting and see where the personnel board uh, comes in and then settle on a number uh, next meeting. You now we should be good getting a uh, should be good getting a guidance out in early in early November. Okay, so if nothing else on this, uh, let's talk about um, minutes, and then I think we're then I think we're Done. Deb, were you going to jump in? Look like I, I, I was, but I'm not sure it's, uh, how relevant it is. I know uh, last week uh, Peter Galatano was um, 
talking about Vadar and, you know, the, the format that we use and stuff like that. And I just got an email from Vadar today that they've updated our things and they're, they're sending me the new report. So I do have that and it, it should be ready to go, you know, next week. Okay. Um, that's great. And that's very relevant. Thanks for, uh, yeah, I, for, yeah. I oh, thanks, to mention thanks, that. thanks for bringing that. I think, I think there'll be a lot of interest. I think there'll be a lot of interest in that. And as we get into particular departmental budgets, I think that'll be super useful. Okay. Yep. All right. Good. Um, okay. Let me pop, um, and it's up. Dan, since we were talking about cola yeah. and, and if, if I may just, uh, sorry, my, my camera is off. I had some activity behind me, so <laughs> uh, is is there any thinking with the town administrator, let's say, coming of, of actually? I, I so I you know the compensation model of you know just based on cola is is not very. <laughs> to, to, to me personally, again, I'm speaking for myself, like really not attractive, right? It, it does not take into account uh, anything like performance or, or experience and getting better at doing the job. And it really does. Is there any thinking about potentially making that change in town? Who, 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 would, who would make such so, a so change? So that's an interesting comment, Wasim. And I have to say, again, just speaking for myself um, in organizations that I've been involved in in the past, uh, you know, there's been performance based merit pay, um, you know, and so on, so on and so forth. So, you know, I've certainly seen organizations do things that uh, that other way. Um, I think uh, Nancy and I talked some this week um, about uh, I think at some long ago past in Sherburne, there was some performance pay. There were some issues with that. And then switch to this, it's probably reaching pretty far back. Um, Nancy may want to jump in with some of that history. Um, but I, I so, so I'd have to say, and again, others may have heard other things. I haven't heard that there's been any big, you know, movement in that direction. But of course, we haven't had a town administrator um, effectively for some time. And that would seem like something that a uh, town administrator, new town administrator, might get interested and do some thinking about. Uh, but I'm not aware of a lot that's happened, you know, in the absence of a uh, town administrator. Nancy, anything you wanted to? Oh, Jane, go ahead. I was just going to say, I would second, I had the same thought in my head, actually, that Wasim just articulated that, you know, because, and I hear Deb's, a lot of the points that Deb is making. So, you know, I'm wondering if this is something else that um, the town, I'll just say, who, whoever the relevant parties are for the town should be looking at. Uh, I, I mean, yeah. my, my hunch is that, uh, and, and Nancy just unmuted, so she can, she, she can say if she shares this, but my hunch is that as Nancy indicated, a number of towns are reconsidering kind of compensation systems. And I would guess that that's partly have a lot of vacancies need to think where compensation needs to be benchmarked to attract, you know, and, and retain high quality employees. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if there's also an element of, huh, well, maybe we should be thinking about, you know, a more fundamental change in uh, compensation uh, policy, which for sure, Burn would you know, could well be something like, uh, you know, as you and Wasim described. Nancy, did you want to jump in? No, I was just uh, going to reiterate what you just said, only um, I did not go into depth with most of the towns that we're talking about um, reviewing. Uh, the compensation and so forth although one of them was very explicit about the fact that they were losing people um the other thing is i i do know that um the merit issue had come up uh in the past and it was very difficult because it is a very subjective thing and depending on who your department head is i know this from my experience as a school teacher as well um, and my husband, a principal, it, it, the, the evaluations of people differ depending on who's doing the evaluation. So merit could 
be very contentious because one person might be more difficult um, in pleasing than another. So in order to eliminate that, they they did not go with merit because as I say, it is very subjective to the, as far as the person who's evaluating and we're a very small town, very small organization. So it makes it, it's not like private industry when you don't know when someone else is getting um, you know, a, a merit raise or something like that. Everybody knows what everybody's getting here. Yeah, I mean, I think a key thing is having a compensation system that retains and attracts the you know highly talented people who work for the town and that we would like to have work for the town. And there are a number of different ways that can be done. Um, as I said, I've worked in organizations that had merit pay and, and in those organizations, much bigger than Sherburn, um, but it worked pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so- um, Matt, Matt, Dan, may I follow up one, one more question? Or... Sure, sure, sure. Let's I, get I don't one wanna, more sorry, last I don't word and just... then let's get to minutes. Yeah. So, but is there a pathway for someone who's doing a great job and maybe even taking on more responsibilities to to get paid more in Sherman or no? Like you're I essentially don't... just that that's it. That's your salary and this is it. I mean, uh, well, that, that doesn't sound like I, I, <laughs> very I motivating think... for someone to actually expand their responsibilities yeah, no, I, I, and do I, more. I, I think you're making an important point and you know others can chime in but I, I think you're making an important point that I think I think that can be a source of real frustration for some of the really you know high performing people in town who feel like you know I'm working hard doing a great job and town doesn't particularly reward them yeah, yeah I, go ahead yeah. Nancy um <laughs> I think that we have demonstrated through the years that we all believe that the people who work for us in our departments are terrific. And, and I think that that's part of personnel's job in the past is sort of had a balance on that because I'm sure that each, I know as a department head for years, I would have put my staff at the top of the list. And I think that, that uh, a lot of, especially residents and some of the volunteers don't really understand what goes on in each office. So it's very hard to have a really uh, non-biased approach to who's doing a super job. Now, for instance, you work very regularly with Deb and with Heidi, but there are, and, and Wendy comes in on some of your meetings. So I'm sure that you have very high opinions of, of their contribution to what you do. But there are other people who work very hard that do a lot in, in town offices as well that wouldn't have that advantage of having your right. input. Right, so, right. Well, so, yeah, I, so I, 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 I was hoping we could kind of draw this to a close. Deb, if you want to get one quick comment. Yeah, then. yeah, my, yeah my, my only comment was, I think that I'm kind of going back to what you said, we didn't have a strong TA who like followed up with this and that the TA was also our human resources person. So it what kind of was a combined, and I don't know if you remember during last year's budget process, they did put in a, a separate uh, line item for human resources. So there, you know, that could be something that could eventually, somebody could be paid to look into this, to come up with a, a plan, see what other towns do to, pro to provide some incentive and some, and pay rate. And the, yeah, obviously this is not a decision that needs to be made by advisory, but I was just you know, gonna say that there is a, a little bit of shift in um, the responsibilities of the human resources. Yeah, yeah, thanks, 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 Deb. Dan, can uh, I get so just one more comment in? Um, not as a discussion point now, but as food for thought um, for the next meeting. But um, could we do something like a 4% COLA and then add a 3% stipend on top of it? Um, to acknowledge the fact that um, inflation has been much higher than 4%, but it wouldn't raise the baseline and ideally wouldn't telegraph the fact that um, everyone got a 7% increase uh, from the perspective of the union negotiations. So in, in your thinking of the stipend as just a one-time payment rather than a yeah. pay increase. Yeah, okay, so yeah. that's, yeah. Um, so that's another interesting model that we could certainly, certainly consider, um, you know, whether the Steve tossed out four and three, obviously those numbers could be combined in a, in a bunch of different, bunch of different, um, bunch of different ways. 
Um, but that's an interesting that's an interesting uh, model for uh, thinking about that too. Um, thanks. So interesting conversation about personnel. Um, I don't think um, advisory is going to get that sorted out this year. Um, but it sounds like it's you know an issue for personnel board for this new HR function for the town administrator with input from us and all the rest to you know maybe begin thinking about because maybe there is maybe there is a maybe there is another way to, to do that. Okay, so thanks for a really interesting discussion on that. Um, so let's um, let's do minutes uh, and get that wrapped up. So I will do a screen share, pop these up. And thanks to uh, Wasim for uh, pulling these um, pulling these together. Uh, and, uh, we can just go through and I'll leave it here for a minute and then scroll on to the next page and please, uh, offer any corrections or suggestions. And I can't see everybody. So please just speak up. Each All one right. looks good to me. Yeah, I'm going to scroll on to uh, page two. And page three. Anybody with any, uh... all right, I'm gonna make these go away so I can see everybody again. And I would entertain a motion to uh, accept the minutes as shown on the screen just a second ago. So moved. Second. second. I'm sorry, second. Thanks, Nora. Okay. Um... So let's do a roll call vote. I'll start at the top. Uh, Nora? Here. Uh, is th that's an aye for- uh, Aye, for sorry. Thanks. Aye, approve. Thank uh, you, sorry. <laughs> Mike? <laughs> Notes. Aye. Aye, uh, Jane? I'll abstain because I wasn't there. Okay. Uh, Wasim? Aye. Uh, Steve? Aye. And I am I as well. So I think that gets us at um, what is that? Uh, five. I think five zero. Five. Yeah. Five zero. Oh, okay. Okay. And I think then we are done. Um, we're back on November second. We obviously have. It sounds like the the guidance letter is in pretty good shape. I will put a schedule of uh, proposed scheduled meetings together, circulate that ahead of time so people have a chance to help me think through if it's the right way to schedule things with the understanding that if Jeremy appears soon uh, and has views on that, we will have an opportunity to revisit that as needed. Um, and then it sounds like the big decision we have to make next meeting is coming to a consensus on um, COLA with the wide range of views that have been expressed. And then Steve, who had this, you know, kind of creative uh, solution for a uh, creative proposal for another way to think about um, putting things together, just to add some, just to add some dimensionality to the problem. So we're no longer just picking a number on a scale, but now we might be picking numbers on multiple scales just to keep it all, just to keep it all interesting. Um, okay, so uh, I think we are done. So, Motion to uh, motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. Thanks. Um, all right, and uh, let's vote. Uh, Steve. Aye. Wasim. Aye. Jane. Aye. Nora. Aye. Mike. Aye. And I am I as well. So I think that gets us at uh, six zero, and we are done. Thanks very much. Um, 
and look forward to seeing everybody on uh, November 2nd. I'll be in Chicago then, so you'll see a different uh, backdrop, <laughs> but uh, it's the beauty of Zoom. It's just, it's just great. So see everybody then. Bye-bye. Thanks, Dan. Bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you.